Got another question on the rate of reaction topic. So this one deals with rate tables, order of reaction, derivation of reaction mechanism, and calculations from an Arrhenius graph. As always, the link to the questions in the description of the video if you wanted to try it first. Okay, so make a start. So we've got to use the results to show that the rate equation that the students derived, this one here, is correct. So we've essentially got to show that the order with respect to thiosulfate is order one and that it's zero order for the H plus. So if we look at experiments one and two, you can see the H plus concentration hasn't changed. The thiosulfate concentration is halved and the rate's halved. So that's a first order relationship for the thiosulfate. And then to explain the H plus being zero order, I've chosen experiments two and three. So you can see that the thiosulfate has quartered, the H plus concentration is halved, the rate's quartered. Now we've already established that it's first order for thiosulfate, so you can see that that quartering of the concentration of thiosulfate is the only thing that's brought the rate down by that factor of four. So the H plus must be zero order. So moving on to the mechanism, now there's a few answers. I've got three, so I'll give you all three of those. But the thing that they must all have in common is they must have one mole of thiosulfate as the reactant in step one, because that's the only thing that features in the rate equation and it's first order. So that is absolutely essential to have that there. So we've got a bit of flexibility now. So the way I do this is I look at the products in the overall reaction. You can see we can make both of these from this thiosulfate, so I'm going to do that. So we've used up both of the S's and two of the O's, so there's an O left. So if I just wrote that, it's wrong, unfortunately, because the charges don't balance, and this is a common mistake. So we've got a 2 minus charge on the left, which means we must have an overall 2 minus charge on the right. We don't want to be putting charges on these, because they don't have charges in the overall equation, so we'll make this O2 minus. Obviously, O2 minus doesn't feature in the overall equation, so we need to get rid of that. So we'll put it in as a reactant for step two. We still need some H plus ions, so we'll bring them into step two. And we still need to make H2O. Well, we can make that from those um, ions, and it works for charge as well. Two plus two minus leaves no overall charge on the left, and obviously H2O has no charge. So that is one way to do it. Next way, we could just make the sulfur and then combine the rest of the atoms. So we get SO3 with a two minus charge. That needs to cancel, so we'll bring it in as a reactant in step two. But we also need those two H plus ions. We'll bring them in, and then we can make what's left, SO2 and H2O. So that one works. And then the third way to do it is to make the SO2 and then combine the rest. So we're left with SO2. 2 minus, bring that in as a reactant in step 2, bring in the 2 H pluses, and make what's left, or what we need, sorry, S and H2O. And again, when they are together, it'll generate the overall equation. So moving on to part B, we've got an Arrhenius question to deal with. So the Arrhenius equation in its Lin form, I write it out like that, because you can clearly see the Y, the M, the X, and the C. So the students plotted the lin of K on the Y axis and one over T on the X axis. And they've obviously got a straight line because it follows a straight line equation. And the gradient of the line is equal to minus EA over R. So you can see I've calculated my change in Y and my change in X. Just be careful that you remember to include the 10 to the minus 3. All of these 1 over t's are times 10 to the minus 3. So that might have caught some people out there. That's just a reminder of the gradient being equal to minus ea over r. So my gradient came out at minus 5862. So next thing I'm going to do is lose the minus signs because I've got them on both sides. I now need to multiply the gradient by r, the gas constant. So I'm getting an answer of 48,737. The important thing to, to note is that we're in joules per mole because there's joules in the gas constant units. So joules per mole, but they want it in kilojoules per mole. 
So I need to divide by 1,000 and give it the three significant figures. So my answer would need to be 48.7 kilojoules per mole. Now there's a bit of leeway with the gradient in the mark scheme, so you're allowed to go between minus 5,700 up to minus 6,100, which means that the activation energy range goes from 47.3 up to 50.7. So moving on to the next part, you'll notice I've copied the graph just to save me going backwards and forwards. So the student has made a mistake by um, estimating the value of lin A at minus 2. So they've obviously extrapolated back and got to that minus 2. What's the problem with doing that? It's down to the fact that the x-axis does not start at 0. And for the final part, the student's calculated a value for k at 0.075. So obviously we need to turn that into the lin of k, so we can use the graph. So that lin of 0.075 is minus 2.59. So we need to find that on the graph. Well, there's minus 2.5, there's minus 2.6. So you can see it's there. So that means that 1 over t is equal to 3.1 times 10 to the minus 3. So what we need to do 1 over that to turn it into t which gives a value for the temperature at 322.6, but we're in Kelvin. Question wants the final answer in degree C, so we need to subtract 273 from that, which gives a temperature of 49.6 degrees C.